Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Vision Seminar. Today, it's a pleasure to have Professor Philip Krahenbull. Philip is an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Texas, Austin. And uh, he works in computer vision, machine learning, and computer graphics. He received his PhD in 2014 at Stanford University, working with Vladimir Koltun, and later spent two years at UC Berkeley, working as a postdoc with Jitendra Malik and Alyosha Efros. Philip has done a lot of great work in action recognition and video understanding and compression, as well as domain transfer, amongst others, and also a set of really interesting works on like semantic segmentation, region proposal, and object detections, where he showed the importance of like finding the uh, right representations to uh, find methods that can be efficient and that can transfer to, to new tasks. Philip, we are really excited to have you here, and welcome to the seminar. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction and uh, thank you for having me. Um, so as I found out this morning, a lot of you are interested in videos and actions. Um, I decided since my student Chavian gave a talk in this uh, seminar not so long ago uh, on videos, I'll instead talk about objects. Um, now, that doesn't mean that you cannot derail this conversation or this presentation at any moment to talk about other things. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point uh, during this, this presentation if you have any questions or you wanna chat about something that's, that's maybe tangen tangential to what I'm talking about. All right, so with this, let's get started. Um, so I started to be interested in uh, computer vision about 10 years ago. And I recently sat down and thought about, well, what has changed in the last 10 years? And my conclusion, maybe a little bit cynical, was that not much has changed. Uh, we still study very much of the same, like a lot of the same problems in computer vision as we did in 2010. Uh, we use slightly different tools to solve these problems, uh, namely deep networks. Uh, we collect a whole lot of more data in the last 10 years. Uh, and we got uh, a lot better performance. Now, the other one thing that really has changed compared to uh, 2010 is that we have kind of one framework to solve almost all of our computer vision problems, which is we phrase almost all computer vision problems as dense prediction. And that includes uh, semantic segmentation, depth estimation, I even include classification as, as kind of an example of dense prediction, where you would just global average pool the output of a dense predictor, uh, and that will give you a classification result for an image. Uh, you also have key point estimation in there. Um, and it's even more interesting than this. It's not just that we have the same framework. We can have the same networks predict many of these uh, modalities by just changing the output of uh, what we predict. Now, the only slight exception to this kind of unified or general framework is object detection. Um, the way we know uh, to detect objects is not by feeding an image in and outcome uh, uh, kind of a dense prediction of what objects are. We instead start to enumerate individual boxes and ask the question, is there an object inside of this box or, or is there an object, is there no object inside of this box? And then we do this for as many boxes as we, as we possibly can. Now, this is nice because it reduces object detection to kind of a binary classification problem. And we know how to do classification with deep networks and so that's why uh, this, this works reasonably well. Uh, boxes are also very easy to annotate. Um, it takes, I think, an average Turker. It takes, uh, if you train them well and give them the right interface, you can do it within, I think, three to five seconds per box. And boxes also give you a decent uh, distance metric in terms of overlap. So if you, let's say, this is the ground truth box that you wanted to annotate, if you predict something like this, the overlap between the two boxes here gives you kind of a, a good measure on how close you got to, the, to what you should have predicted. Now, this is the nice part of uh, using boxes. Obviously, there's also uh, many disadvantages to using boxes. Um, the biggest one and kind of the root of all evil is that there's just too many boxes. 
So if you look at all possible boxes, it's quadratic in the number of pixels. And so if you think about this for a moment, um, think about kind of object detection. Object detection is a problem that lives somewhere in between dense prediction, where you predict something for every pixel, and just a global prediction, a kind of a classification prediction per, per uh, one label per image. But now we phrase it as this super dense prediction where we have n pixels come in and we wanna make a decision over n squared uh, possible output boxes. And so this seems like kind of a complete wrong way of, of thinking of, of objects. Uh, it's kind of this super dense prediction. It also means kind of that this massive amount of boxes means that the actual implementation of detectors often has some, some ugly kind of little things hidden in it. Um, I already mentioned the, the, the super dense prediction, um, but in order to make this work efficiently, uh, we can obviously not enumerate all boxes. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a couple of prototypical boxes that we call anchors, and now we're gonna slide these anchors over the image at multiple scales and somehow hope that these anchors get close to our ground truth boxes. Now, at training time, the issue with this is that you now need to decide which anchors are close to a ground truth annotation and which anchors are not close to a ground truth annotation. This is often done by saying, if an anchor overlaps with a certain degree with a ground truth box, you say, okay, it's positive. You should have classified this as an object. If it, agree, if it overlaps with a certain other threshold with the ground truth, you say it's negative. And so you have these two kind of thresholds you need to tune and it gets messy very quickly. Now, at test time, uh, the fact that you slide these different anchors or that you enumerate a large number of boxes um, over the entire image leads to, the, leads to duplicate detections. So for one, single object, you can have multiple boxes that overlap it quite heavily and you will get many, many detections. Now, the hack to get rid of this is to just suppress all but the box that has the maximum activation. And so you have to take this one post-processing step. Um, and the last thing uh, about anchors or boxes in general is if you only enumerate a fixed number of boxes, you're gonna miss out on the oddly shaped objects. And this is uh, very evident if you look at which images in the COCO data set, uh, standard anchor-based detector has the most, uh, the hardest time with. And so the, the second hardest image for faster RCNN on COCO is this image here, where you have lots of uh, small cell phones. Uh, you have these small cell phones here. And there's just no kind of anchor box or no box that you can slide over the image. It has a fixed size that gets close to these. Um, the handbag might also just be hard to detect because it's only partially visible here. And now by far the hardest image in the entire COCO data set is this one here, which is this very elongated train that uh, anchor-based detector can never express whatsoever. Um, and so this led us to, to think of kind of, can we come up with a simpler representation of objects? Instead of boxes, which are kind of quadratic in the number of uh, pixels that you have an image, can we come up with a, with a kind of dumber representation of an object? And the representation I really like is representing each object just as a point. Um, so just to represent each object, with the center point uh, or the, the kind of either the center of mass or the center of, uh, of the box that, that surrounds this object. Now, if you have other objects like this uh, cooler here or the paddle, you would just put another point and say, I'm gonna detect an object, but just detecting individual points in an image. Um, we did this about uh, one and a half or a bit over a year ago. Um, now, if you wanna go back from these points to boxes, then all you need to do is you need to regress to the size of the object from that center location. And so 
that's pretty much the detector that 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 we came up with about uh, one and a half years ago. Uh, so you detect points and then regress to height and width of the box uh, of that object. Now, in terms of uh, technical details, I'm not going to go into the, the, the low-level technical details, but in terms of the kind of the rough technical details of this, the way we predict these, uh, these centers is we use a key point estimator uh, that predicts a dense heat map over the entire image, and it produces little peaks. You can think of these as little local maximas at the center location of an object. And then we also predict a feature uh, or a, a, a 2D feature map from which we can then extract the feature at the center location and regress to the size of the object. Now the heat map, we predict class specific. Say uh, we predict a, a key point or a center point for each class. The width and the height of the object, we, we predict class agnostic meaning that we predict, uh, we use the same width and height predictor for all classes. And that's pretty much it. Um, that's, the, that's the object detector. Um, Train this on the COCO data set using a key point prediction uh, architecture, which is the hourglass architecture here sh shown on the side. And about one and a half years ago, it worked pretty well. Uh, it beats uh, kind of all the fast object detectors out there by a reasonable uh, margin. Um, by now, so one and a half years is a long, long time in object detection land. Um, by now, there is, uh, I think now there's YOLO V5 uh, that, that beat us pretty handily. I think YOLO V5 is somewhere up here by now. And RetinaNet also managed to move somewhere up here uh, by just tuning the, net, the network architecture or the training process. Um, but one and a half years ago, this, this was uh, kind of uh, the state of the art, at least for fast detectors. Philip, sorry, just one question, yeah. do you mind? Uh, what, what happens yeah. in- No, no, interrupt me. Yeah, here you have uh, the horizontal axis is time, inference time. Uh, what happens if you just don't care about time? Oh yeah, we get beaten, we get beaten Badly by uh, Cascade RCNN. Um, I think the so if you if you if you don't care about time, um, faster RCNN will be at some point somewhere up here, and then Cascade RCNN will come in later off the screen. And we essentially the key point architectures that we tried kind of plateau here. Now I will show a version of this uh, of CenterNet, which we'll call CenterNet two. Uh, depending on how fast I'm going through these slides, I'll show this in maybe five minutes. Um, we can actually make CenterNet work uh, at close to the state of the art by now, um, by just, yeah. But I'll, I'll talk about this in five minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, any other questions? All right. Um, so here is just some visual example on how this actually works. Uh, here I only highlight the, the most prominent seven or eight objects. And you can see kind of the detected key points in the heat map. And then I'll just put the box around it uh, where we regress. And it's pretty interesting that we can actually regress to a very accurate box from just this center, from just the feature at the center location here. Um, we can also regress to a very accurate location of the center of the object. And the reason for this is that if you look at the architecture that we use to predict this, this key point, the receptive field of this architecture at this location here is larger than the entire image already. So in order to predict the output at this key point, it has seen all the pixels in the image already uh, to make its decision. And so that's why it works. It's not necessarily that it's a key point predictor that only looks at local features. This is an entire deep network that gets to, through its many layers, gets to see the entire image. It's just centered at that, at that pixel location. And so this is why this works uh, in general. Here's another example. Again, I'm just highlighting the, the largest um, uh, eight objects here. And again, you can see 
uh, the box is actually localized reasonably well uh, for the fact that we just regress everything from just one center, uh, center location. Now, the, what I'm really excited about in this framework is that we only need to detect points and then everything else can be regression. And so this far I've shown you how to regress to the size of the object um, or the size of the box that contains that object. But we can also regress to a 3D box, uh, a distance to camera or 3D orientation to get a 3D detection or monocular 3D detection. Or we can also regress to locations of individual key points. Now for the key points to make this work well, we need to go refine them a little bit. Um, but for the 3D detection, we can just do this from just the feature at the center point here. Hi, can I ask another question? Yes. Uh, so this reminds me, you know, th th this type of approach, what was going on in computer vision like in 2005 and so on with all the voting mechanisms and so on that had similar representations. So one of the things also was that the scale invariance was quite tricky. So here you are training one network to detect the centroid at all scales, no? Or do you do one per scale? Um, we have two versions of this. We can have a multi-scale version of it. Um, for the basic results, we just use a single scale version. And then just, the, I think there's two differences to the 2005 sort of methods. One is deep networks are somewhat magical and they don't care about scale as much, or they, they can learn to be scale invariant. Um, the, the second thing is I actually think going from the center out is a better idea than trying to go vote for where the center would be. Um, we had uh, the, the, the paper that led up to this actually did exactly the opposite. We voted for kind of we, we, we grouped points together um, and then kind of voted for the center. Uh, but we found detecting the center and then going outward is actually a lot easier because you don't have to do a grouping stage. You can just detect the center and then you can just regress from the center up. Well, if you vote for a center, you need to go and group these different votes together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so I'm just gonna show some results on 3D layout estimation. So this is on Kitty, um, where we simply take the center, um, the, the uh, center net, and instead of regressing to 2D box, we regress to the, the location of a 3D box. Now, the one thing that um, we found was quite important in Kitty is that there's actually a difference between where the center of a 3D box is versus the center of a 2D box. And that is because of perspective foreshortening. Um, so since the 3D box is gonna be slightly shorter on one end uh, because it's farther away from the camera, the 2D center and the 3D center are slightly shifted from one another. And so if we learn to, um, to regress to the, uh, if you learn to detect 3D centers that are slightly shifted, we actually get a much more accurate localization of the 3D box from a monocular estimate than we would get if we would first look at the 2D object and then try to place the 3D box inside of the 2D object. And um, this is uh, the result here on Kitty. And we did, initially, we didn't uh, consider the difference between the 2D and the, the, the 3D centers. And if we don't consider this, our performance would be roughly, uh, I think, 10 points or, or more lower. But if we correct for the actual 3D location and then just regress for the 3D box, we get uh, a much higher performance than other monocular 3D estimations. It also worked quite well on uh, new scenes, um, which is a fairly recent data set. And there, at time, at the initial uh, publication time of this, we actually beat um, the, the simple LIDAR baseline for new scenes, um, which is point pillars. Uh, by now, uh, the LIDAR baselines are much better, and I'll talk about this later in this talk. All right, uh, code for CenterNet is available online uh, on GitHub, so if you wanna play with this, uh, feel free. Um, I think it's not too hard to use. Um, yeah. And so I want to 
to stop and slow down a little bit here and talk a little bit about uh, Centernet and what I like about it and what I maybe don't like about it uh, uh, as much. And so the one thing I really like about Centernet is that the point, a point is a much, much simpler representation of an object than a, a box is or an anchor is. Uh, I'm not necessarily as much against boxes as I am against anchors, uh, which is these sliding boxes that you that you move over the, the image. I actually think that the point is just a much simpler representation. It's just dense prediction, and you just extract, extract local peaks. Um, and then you can regress to size or anything else you would want from that, from that image location. Um, the thing that maybe is slightly annoying about Centernet is that it's very different from previous detectors. Um, first, it's a single stage detector, meaning that you can actually not do things like uh, instant segmentation very well because you cannot predict, well, you can try, but it's gonna be very hard to predict a full instance mask from just one center location here. I mean, you can probably try, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be quite hard um, to take a feature that's right here and then try to predict an entire mask out. Um, and the, the one thing that was really annoying is that it actually throws away a lot of the, the nice engineering that went into building object detectors over the last five or more years. Um, one example of this is that architectures that work well in standard anchor-based detectors don't work well in Centernet, and architectures that work well in Centernet don't necessarily work well for standard detectors. Um, Centernet works better with semantic segmentation architectures, uh, that is hourglass and uh, similar architectures, while standard detectors usually uh, work better with classification architectures such as residual networks. Um, and I guess we're currently in the process of fixing this. Uh, we have a second version of Centernet uh, that tries to kind of address this bottom half here. Um, and if there's no questions for Centernet, I'll go on and briefly talk about what we're currently working on for Centernet version two. All right. Um, so Centernet two is it's a very simple extension of the, the original Centernet idea. Um, we again start out by predicting a heat map for where the object is, uh, and we predict kind of the estimated size of that object. Um, but now we, instead of producing a box here, we actually start to use ROI align and crop out a region feature and then regress to a new, oops, sorry. Um, new score and new location. And we go back, look at the slightly updated location here and update the score again. And we repeat this, I think a total of three times uh, in the class cascade RCNN style. And so, there's really two ways to think about this. Um, one way to think about this is we use Centernet and then we just do multiple stages of kind of a two-stage detector or a multi-stage detector like Cascade RCNN on top. Um, and so in that, if you think about it this way, it's uh, essentially just refining the output of Centernet. The other way to think about this is you can think of this as similar to Cascade RCNN, but instead of using a region proposal network, we now uh, use the Centernet uh, as a region proposal. And I'll talk about why this is a good idea in, in a moment um, when we look at the results. But I hope that the central idea is not too hard to understand. Um, so in terms of results, uh, it works uh, much better than the first version of Centernet. And this is, this is still here using a very small ResNet 50 backbone. Um, I'll have results uh, with, a, with a larger backbone in a moment. 
but for a, a small ResNet 50 backbone, uh, you can see it's about a three point jump over original CenterNet, and it's about a one point jump over Cascade RCNN, uh, which is, if you use the right backbone, Cascade RCNN is still more or less the, the state of the art here. Um, and we have results both on uh, Coco and on Elvis that show a, a healthy improvement uh, by just uh, adding uh, or by combining CenterNet with a multi-stage uh, detection approach. Now, the most interesting part here is it actually gets faster. So um, if you take Cascade RCNN and replace the initial um, proposal network with uh, with CenterNet. Uh, so if you make CenterNet and then strap the, the upper half of Cascade RCNN, Cascade RCNN will get faster. And the reason for this is that uh, the initial detector is a lot better and we need much fewer boxes that we, uh, that we do the second stage with. And so that makes it uh, um, quite a bit faster at inference time. Um, now, if you look at this in terms of, uh, we submitted this model to the Elvis challenge and we'll know in, in, in a week uh, how well we did. Um, but compared to the baseline on the Elvis challenge, uh, this model actually does uh, quite well. So the baseline is, um, I think it's, a f it's the challenge winner from last year and it's a multi-stage or uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mask RCNN as far as I understand. Um, I'm not sure if they use a cascade or not. Um, but you can see the difference uh, of using the CenterNet version 2 over just the baseline uh, or the, the, the winner from last year is actually quite significant on, Coke, uh, on, on Elvis. It's about nine points or, uh, well, depending on, on, on if you look at the validation or test def. And so this is, by the way, this is a really beefy architecture and Xingyi who did this, uh, implemented all the tricks he could find online to make these numbers uh, be as high as, as, as possible. So this model, I think, took about over a week to train, um, but it's the best we can push uh, CenterNet this, uh, this far. All right. Um, and we'll have code and write up uh, of this version at some point soon. Um, any questions about this this far? If not, I'll just cruise on. Um, so I'll, in the next talk, I'll, in the next part of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about um, why optics are not just a good, way, good representation for re representing static objects. Uh, I'm gonna talk about why they're also a good idea to represent objects through time, uh, in particular tracking. Uh, but before I talk about uh, tracking objects as points, I'll first give a brief overview on, on kind of what are the most popular trackers out there uh, right now. And kind of the most popular way to track objects nowadays is tracking by detection, which is uh, you first run a detector over all the, the images you have. And then um, you extract a feature for each of the detected boxes. Uh, it's gonna be some deep network feature. And then you do some sort of uh, matching between uh, either bipartite matching between neighboring frames, or you can even do some more global matching to then identify which objects or which boxes uh, belong to together. Now there's some variants of this. There's also some versions that uh, try to do this frame by frame by feeding previous detected boxes as region proposals into the, into the tracker in the next time frame. Um, but this is kind of roughly the, the big, um, the, the kind of the winning idea right now for tracking. Obviously, I oversimplified this massively, so excuse me if you like tracking and you would like me to go more into more details. Um, now, I'm gonna show you in the next uh, few minutes that if you do this uh, with points, that this becomes a lot easier. So if you do tracking by detection uh, as points, 
uh, tracking simplifies massively. And so the reason for this is that if you now detect objects as points, um, the difference between two objects in two different frames is just a difference between two point locations. So the difference from object, from this object or from this person up here, from one frame to the other, is just an offset. It's just an arrow uh, that maps the previous location to the current location. Okay? And so this is something that we can predict directly using a deep network. We couldn't do this with the box because with the box you would have to regress to four coordinates and you are very unlikely to actually hit an exact location of another box. But with points we can do this because we densely predict where points are in the, in the scene. And to be uh, a, a bit more explicit about this, what we do is we look at tracks or we look at tracklets that are already detected in a previous frame. Then we look at two frames, uh, two consecutive frames, and now we train a network to both predict, ob uh, predict uh, object centers and at the same time predict where this object might have been in the previous location, in the previous time step, sorry. And we do this for all objects in a scene. And now if we run this tracker, once we trained it, all we need to do is we need to detect objects and then we look at the previous frame and we do a nearest neighbor matching on where the tracker thought the object was in the last frame. Okay, so we just greedily track uh, where, the, where, the object, where the tracker thought the, the object was before. Um, and so you can do this just using uh, one network uh, where you feed in, uh, where you stack two input frames and you stack the previous tracks and you predict uh, three things. You predict the center locations of objects, their size and the offset. And so this is again, just a heat map and a, a couple of regression targets. And it works uh, reasonably well. Um, so if you uh, look at the results on person tracking, which is the MOT challenge, um, we, uh, if, we, if you look at private detectors, which is detectors where we, allow, we are allowed to detect new objects, um, we are second best and we, are only got, we only get beaten by a tracker that uh, takes about two seconds per frame to, to run that uses a lot of person re-ID features while we just use an offset. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay, I'll, I'll turn off my sound until this goes away. Um, okay. Yeah, so and then if you're allowed to uh, track, uh, if you're allowed to um, track objects, um, if, if you're allowed to detect new objects, uh, the gap to prior methods, which is, sorry, if you're not allowed to detect new objects, um, if you're only allowed to track, only predict the offset to previous objects, then the gap to prior work actually becomes uh, a lot larger here. So here in the public detection, we are forced to use uh, prior work, a prior detector, and we're only allowed to link up objects through time or slightly refine their location. Uh, and there, in that setting, uh, predicting the offset just works somehow magically better than everything else that was tried there. Um, and the cool thing is we can also train this on just uh, uh, static Coco images by using a uh, massive data augmentation where we, we chitter the image and then predict offsets between the chittered image and the original image. And that, um, that allows us to learn a tracker um, that can, from static images, actually track objects in a video reasonably well. Um, we also uh, ran this on Kitty, and there, again, it uh, worked quite a bit better than the prior state of the art. 
Uh, code for this is available online if you're interested. Uh, it's uh, built on the center, uh, center point repository. Now, briefly, we also uh, did uh, apply CenterNet to LiDAR images uh, in which we just used a 3D point cloud backbone uh, to then predict uh, 3D locations in, in LiDAR images and 3D uh, vehicle locations. Yeah, 3D vehicle orientation. Uh, again, there it, this works quite well. It gives us uh, a reasonably large boost over kind of prior methods, no matter what backbone we try. Um, and I think we're still number one in 3D tracking on new scenes uh, using this method. And we're number two on 3D detection. We got beaten by an ensemble of six models, uh, which um, we just didn't have the compute to train. All right, and code for this is also available online if you're interested. All right, so this far, kind of, we looked at sort of problems where we train things on a single data set, let's say COCO, and we got a COCO detector, and then we evaluate on that single data set, let's say uh, the COCO evaluation set. Now, this is a very nice setup if you want to measure how well detectors are progressing and which detector is better than which other detector. But it's definitely not something you would want at the end of the day. If, if you want somebody to use your detector, you wouldn't want them to just use a COCO detector that knows about 80 classes because a user of your detector might actually want to know about, some, uh, about something that, that is beyond these 80, 80 classes. And so in the last part of this talk, um, I'll, I'll briefly go into some of the early steps we're taking towards kind of learning detectors that, that know more uh, about the world than just is captured by just a single data set. And um, to motivate this, um, let, let me say that if you want to train a detector that knows about any object X uh, in the world, you probably have a labeled data set out there that contains object X. Um, if you don't, then it's pro it, it, it might also not be too expensive to annotate uh, it yourself, but I'm pretty convinced that we have so many data sets and so many annotations by now that you will find one data set that contains something that's close to the object you're interested in. Now, kind of the bad news is that it's unlikely the case that if you're interested in any object X and Y, that one single data set is gonna contain uh, whatever you're looking for. And conversely, it also is unlikely the case that if you use any pre-trained model that is in, in any of the model zoos that we have online, that this will fulfill your needs if you wanna, have, if you wanna detect a specific uh, class or a specific set of, uh, of object classes. And so the main reason for this is because off-the-shelf detectors are right now just limited to individual data sets. And so what we want to do in this last part uh, of this talk, uh, what I'm going to go into, into detail here is, can we train a detector on multiple data sets? And the short answer is yes, we can. Um, so the simplest uh, way to train this detector is to just take multiple data sets uh, uh, and Whenever we feed an image from data set A into the detector during training, we just have a specific head that just looks at that data set, right? Then we should take an image from a different data set. We just swap out the head um, and predict a, a, a different output. And so you can actually train these detectors relatively easily. You can even just, like, so the way you, you do this in practice is you just random, like you, you construct random batches, one for each data set, and then you just use the loss function and all the tricks that you have available for this one specific data set. You take a gradient step, and then you go on to the next data set, and you just rotate data sets that way. Um, 
The cool thing is it actually doesn't slow down training at all. Um, so if you, if you add in four data sets, you can just train for four times as long and you will get roughly the same performance as if you would train four individual classifiers on each of the four data sets. So the number of the, 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 the amount of compute that you need to train four classifiers using kind of a joint uh, backbone and different output heads is actually the same as if you would train um, four different classifiers with four different uh, backbones. Um, this was very surprising to me in the beginning, uh, but I actually think this, this makes, the longer I think about it, the more sense it makes to me. Um, it's, 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 it's very nice, but it's not quite a unified detector yet. Um, so it's not unified because we now have, for every input image, we now predict what data set A thought this image was, data set B thought this image was, and data set uh, C thought that image was. And so to, to make a, a point here, if you look at this image I've shown you earlier, we would now get a box that says, well, this is a, there's a Coco pedestrian here or a Coco person here. There's an Objects 365 pedestrian here and there's whatever other person class there is. And all of these objects would be labeled as individual objects uh, that kind of overlap one another. Now this is obviously not, it's not, not the case that there is three or four objects here. There's one object here and that's a pedestrian, that's a person. And so I think what we're missing in this very basic version of kind of this unified detector is that we don't reason about object classes that are the same as one class. Um, we actually just repeat a lot of different classes. Now, an easy way to fix this is, well, easy. Uh, one way to fix this is to just manually sit down and now look at which classes from which data set um, kind of correspond to which other classes from which other data set. Um, this is relatively time intensive. It can take anywhere between a day uh, to, like if you want to do this very, like, absolutely correctly. Uh, it took other people, not in detection, but in semantic segmentation, took them a month or two to do this properly. Uh, but they also went in and collected and corrected some, label, uh, some labels. It's very error prone, which I'll show you uh, in a moment. And if you want to do this right, you need to know what the annotators of each individual data set were asked to annotate before uh, they went in and annotated these, these objects. And um, one good example of why you need to know this is um, we have an example of, uh, we didn't do this ourselves, but somebody else did uh, collect a common taxonomy between open images, objects 365 and Coco. And here are just some little snippets out of this common taxonomy. Um, the person that did this was European, so he did not realize that football and American football are actually not the same thing. Um, I think if you live in Europe your entire life, you don't realize this until you go to America and you see American football and you notice this is not football. Um, and so here the footballs are merged, but soccer is a category of its own and rugby is a category of its own. And then uh, for bird itself or for mouse, uh, I'll, I'll talk about why this is wrong uh, in a moment. So here's the, the football example for those of you who have never seen American football. American football looks a lot closer to rugby than uh, actual kind of English football, um, which is also referred to as soccer. Now, the example with bird is actually a bit more interesting. So here, uh, you need to know how Objects 365 was annotated. And so Objects 365 has four bird classes. One is parrot, one is duck, and one is swan. And everything that's not a, a, a parrot, a duck, or a swan is labeled as wild bird. And so that actually is exactly the same class as a bird in open images or in Coco, where they also have, I think, Coco or Open images definitely has the, the duck and swan class, and then the wild bird is just what's, what's uh, like bird and wild bird is just a different name for the class that's every other bird that, that people cannot annotate. 
And the most fun one is the mouse. Um, if you just look at the labels, it might make sense to just merge all mouse together or all mice together. But it turns out that Open Images has one category that's called computer mouse. And that is the mouse that most people think of when they annotate mice uh, in Coco and Objects 365. And so you can only know that the Open Images mouse here is actually, is actually an animal mouse if you see that there's another class that explicitly says there's a computer mouse. And so these are some easy mistakes you can make when you, when you, when you uh, merge these categories. Um, and so the reason why we found these mistakes is because we actually devised the system to automa automatically find uh, uh, taxonomy or automatically find kind of a unified detection system that tries to, find, that tries to merge these classes together um, in a, in a, in kind of, in, in a completely automatic way. And so the way we start out with this is we first train this classifier that predicts a separate output for every single data set. And now we will run this classifier on some new images. And we now play a little, uh, a little mind game uh, where we ask ourselves, well, what would happen if we would run this classifier, but instead of outputting class A of data set one, separate from class B of data set uh, two, um, what would happen if we now would merge these classes? How different would this classifier now be if we merged these two classes? And it turns out that the answer to this is actually very simple. So the difference or the, the, the difference in the classification itself, and I'm not gonna derive this here, I'm just gonna give you the result, is the sum over all possible box locations, and we're gonna call this K of, let's uh, say this is classifier one, this is classifier two in this simple example, of the response of classifier one over box K minus the response of classifier two or box K. And then it depends if you wanna take the L1 or the L2 difference, it's either uh, the squared or just the L1 norm of this. If you have multiple boxes, this just becomes, um, if you have multiple data sets, this just becomes kind of the difference uh, overall of classifier I, a minus some mean classifier squared. So it's essentially just something that looks a lot like the standard deviation. And I guess there's a sum over i here missing. And so you can measure this for all sort of, for all pairs, for all triplets of potential classes. You can also be a bit more efficient about this and measure it only for classes that make sense to merge. And so you can enumerate how big of an error would you make by merging several classes on kind of unseen or new data? And so now we know what is the cost of merging class A with class B between different data sets. Now that we know this cost, um, we can now set up an optimization problem for which classes should we merge and which classes should we not merge. In, 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 uh, in, in this unified detector. And the way we do this is by simply just introducing a variable x here uh, that says, should we merge a, a certain set of uh, outputs or should we not merge a certain, a certain set of outputs? Now, the cost of merging some outputs is gonna be what I described on the previous slide. We can do this over an arbitrary number of, uh, of um, of data sets. Uh, here I just enumerated it for two or three data sets. Now we say we either uh, we merge or not merge that, that variable should either be zero or one, meaning one means we merge, zero means we don't merge. And then we can set up some linear constraints uh, that say that you cannot merge a class more than, or an output more than once, which is uh, this constraint here. And then it also says that uh, the, the constraint here on the bottom says that you should merge at least K classes, meaning that we wanna create a taxonomy that actually merges some of the outputs. 
where k simply just controls like if, if k is zero means that nothing is merged because uh, like the the optimization would never merge anything on its own um, I went over this way too fast um, I'm just going to show you the results and then uh, we can have uh, some questions uh, in a moment so the results we get uh, if we do if you optimize for this uh, unified detection automatically is that just by looking at the images and looking at the classifier responses, the outputs that make most sense to merge here is that we actually output uh, football and soccer, which are just two two words for the same thing, and it also turns out that um, in a lot of annotations on objects three sixty five or op, uh, or open images. Uh, American football images are labeled as rugby in open images and Optics 365 um, images that contain rugby are labeled as American football. So the classifier just uh, decided to merge these two classes automatically. Bird and wild bird are merged together because they again refer to the same concept. And the mouse, even though for Optics 365 it's actually listed under animals, uh, it's only a computer mouse which again is visually more similar uh, to the computer mouse category in Optics 365, uh, in open images. And so this can all be found automatically. Um, and so I think the most uh, surprising thing to me was that we trained this, uh, this uh, model under this unified taxonomy um, for the RVC challenge, which uh, I, think is, I think it's gonna be over in, in about a week. Um, and we get close to state-of-the-art numbers on, uh, on each of the individual data sets, uh, even though we train one classifier um, with a shared taxonomy uh, to predict labels for all categories. So we don't train a, 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 a data set specific model, we train one model on all data sets, and that one model actually performs very close to the state-of-the-art. We get about a 0.53 MAP on COCO, and then 0 0.6 MAP or 0 0.61 on open images. And if you look at kind of the leaderboard, we rank number four uh, on the um, open images um, leaderboard right now using a detector that actually reasons about classes from all, uh, from all data sets we train on. And we are still in the top 10 on the, on the COCO leaderboard. Uh, here we don't show up on the leaderboard because we have to submit it to a different server. All right, um, with that, I think I'm, I'm roughly at time now. Um, and um, I think the two main points I want you to remember from this talk is uh, like point-based representations for objects are actually a very simple alternative to anchor-based models. And if you have a chance to use them, you should use them, uh, I hope. You don't use anchors. Um, and it also turns out to be much simpler than expected to train a detector on more than just a single data set. And if you ever train detectors, I'll encourage you to actually think about this, uh, to train a detector that maybe is general and, and, and learns about all objects that we currently have. There is definitely plenty of work to be done still, uh, especially on the, on the, on the second part. Um, I think we just scratched the surface showing that it's possible to train these, uh, these detectors on multiple data sets. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, and um, this is great. Uh, are there any questions? I have a quick um, question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. I have a question. Um, yeah. I was wondering for the objects as points, do you have any analysis of the uh, effect on object scale? It seems like if you have a point representation, you should be able to deal with uh, like more extreme ranges of like large objects or small objects, perhaps. Yes, I didn't include this in the presentation because I couldn't find the images. So we looked at we looked at what what objects we fail on, um, and so. Kind of we had we did this analysis on what is what is what are the worst objects to detect for uh, our method versus the worst objects to detect for uh, anchor based methods and for anchor based methods it's, it's clearly the very large ones uh, or the oddly shaped ones um, for us it wasn't so we actually got the like 
yeah, I did. I don't. I don't have this in the presentation, but we do. We do detect. We can detect a very elongated train with a very low confidence and 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 the bad box, but we can get close to it. Um, but then there's other things where uh, where anchors are just much much better. Um, yeah, it's usually the classification part where anchors uh, are are better, like in the hard to classify objects, uh, where it's just where the, the center-based ones, where we just don't have a good enough backbone to, to get, to get uh, good results. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. I have a quick question. Uh, so thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, and I really like the idea of representing objects as points. That's super neat and interesting. And I was just wondering if there's anything special about the center of the object or would making a weaker decision of detecting any point on the object and then regressing to the left width, right width, and top height and bottom height, like have any advantage, maybe for heavily occluded objects or? Yes. Um, yeah, I wish, I wish we could use a canonical point. Um, I think we were just being lazy uh, in using the center of the object. Uh, I don't think there's anything magical about it. Um, it does, like in the very vanilla version, it allows you to not use non-maximum suppression if you just use the center. Uh, it allows you to just get rid of non-maximum suppression because uh, there's not going to be, you're never going to predict the same object twice um, if you predict the center of the object. But other than that, uh, I don't see a reason why the center is somehow magical. And I think there is actually, there's some work that, uh, not necessarily for the center, but for uh, extreme points or for points on the, on the, um, on kind of the segmentation mask of the object or in the boundary of the object, there people started to optimize where to place these points. Um, and I bet if there's not already a paper out there, uh, there's gonna, the same trick on optimizing kind of where to find points on the boundary of the object can be applied to kind of placing the center of the object at a slightly different location. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. So like, say you have like a person standing in front of a car and the center happens to be in the same position. Is that something that is, I guess, like a failure case of like this method? Yes. Okay. Um, if it's two different classes, no. Because we predict, oh, okay. uh, we predict a, a peak per per class. Now you will have an issue with the size regression because we use the same size regression for all classes, and we actually measured this. And so, I think it happens in point zero one five percent of the objects in the Coco data set that they their center collides, and we just ignore those. Um, yeah, we yeah. decided one ninety nine point nine percent accuracy will worry about the last point zero one five percent. And then, yeah, that makes sense. And then, I guess with CenterNet two, are you guys working on like solving the mask um, regression as well? Yeah, yeah. So we we use uh, we have a mask prediction for the Elvis uh, challenge, and so the mask prediction is just done the same way yeah. uh, mask does. Yeah, that's cool. I really like this point representation approach. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Philip. Uh, I have a question regarding what you said about the non-maximal suppression. Uh, if I understood correctly, you're doing like dense prediction of the object centers. So what happens if you predict two centers of the same object that are very nearby and then regress them on the boxes and they like intersect highly? Yeah. Um, you, yes, you can still run non-maximum suppression, um, and it will give you. I think if if okay. So first, let me let me maybe say that we do use non-maximum suppression if you use multiple scales. If you predict points like the centers at multiple scales, we need to use non-maximum suppression so that the scales don't interfere with one another. Um, if you run it um, on one single scale. Um, then you can you can gain about half uh, point in MA, in MAP by running on maximum suppression, but then we just decided it's not it's not worth it. Now for all the experiments we did at CenterNet two, we always use non maximum suppression because then um, like boxes can actually can actually go and get close to one another again. Thank you. 
And I have a question about the multi data set uh, um, detection. Maybe it's a, it is a bit far fetched, but uh, I, I think the idea of like, like this approach for merging labels is very cool. But on the other hand, some data sets separate classes, like the separation of classes in some data sets can also be valuable for other data sets where these classes are merged. Uh, so this is a very neat approach for merging classes. Do you have thoughts about approaches for leveraging other data sets for separating classes that maybe should have been separated when you were labeling? Yes, we thought about this and we tried some things and then we, we, we admitted the defeat. Um, I think that's where we are right now. I think like what you're hinting at is, is, is uh, some inferring some sort of hierarchy of classes, right? That in one data set, uh, like the bird class in one data set might be like 10 different birds in another data set and that that, that would kind of give you um, uh, like you could transfer some signal from one data set to another this way. And you're absolutely right, we, we should. Um, I just don't have a good idea. And our current is to just um, have the network just supervise the 10 different classes and the joint class as two different outputs. And yes, you will predict both of them uh, in the end. You will predict bird and what fine grain bird it is. But everything that we tried with a nice hierarchy just didn't really work out this far. And the simple thing of just duplicating the output along a hierarchy um, kind of worked much better. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yes, in terms of like extending this to panoptic segmentation, is there anything clever you have in mind in terms of like stuff classes or would you just use a semantic like segmentation backbone, I guess? Yeah, I would just give up and use a semantic segmentation backbone, I think. I mean, what we, what we predict is already very close to a semantic, uh, mm -hmm. like it's, it's already a dense prediction, um, like relatively dense. Uh, it's, I think, for the original CenterNet, we downsampled by 4x. And for the CenterNet 2, I think we do 8x. Um, I think you could still, you could probably just regress. You could just have another head for semantic classes. Yeah. Um, I don't, yeah, I didn't, we didn't think of panoptic segmentation that much yet. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Philippe, again, for coming. It was great. And mm -hmm. thank you.